In one of the most inhospitable places in Africa, one man struggles against the toughest conditions and life-threatening encounters. Great, great news. Revealing the secret lives of a family of rare brown hyenas. The Bushmen called these great expanses Mahadi Khadi, a place of mirages and salt. An accurate description for the remains of a vast lake which formed millions of years ago in the Kalahari Desert of Botswana. The lake has since dried up but its imprint in the desert is clearly visible from space. The Mahadi Khadi pans cover 12,000 square kilometers of land, making them the largest salt pans in the world. For more than half the year, the surface of the pans is a bed of crystallized salt, reaching depths of up to 40 meters. During this time, water is extremely scarce and very hard to find making this an inhospitable landscape for many living things, including humans. But one man has endured this harshness for the past two years. Glyn Maud is a Zambian-born researcher conducting the first study ever made on Mahadi Khadi's elusive brown hyenas. He started living here as a guide, leading groups of adventurers through one of the world's most remote areas. My first year in the Makadi Kadi, I saw brown hyenas once, and that was after 11 months. I saw tracks, I saw scent marks, but I never actually saw the animal. And at the end of my time as a, as a guide, it was just the most obvious step in the world to study the brown hyena, it's something I really wanted to do. This proved to be a very difficult task. First, he had to find a suitable study subject, and then he had to collar the hyena. After a frustrating year, he finally collared one a young male, which he named Bom, a Bushman name. Bom is now a two-year-old young adult who wanders the vast desert plains in search of food and water. By following Bom, Glyn has been unraveling the mysterious life of the brown hyenas. For the past year, Bom has been returning every few nights to his birthplace, leading Glynn to a den site now occupied by the next generation of cubs, his half-brothers and sisters, and Venus, their mother. This is the first and only den that Glynn has found, and he spends as much time as he can here, observing and documenting the family's activities. It's remarkable to be able to be out here and to spend so much time with brown hyenas, considering how rare they are. There are probably less than 10,000 brown hyenas in existence, which is very low. Bomb spends more and more time away from the den. He's independent now, but his younger brothers are still very reliant on their mother especially for food. She sleeps most of the day and joins her cubs in the late afternoon. At this young age, the cubs have already learnt the ritual of greeting others. They practice with their mother. Glynn makes a record of all the behavior he observes on a dictaphone. 
They often greet each other by um, sniffing the other hyena's anal pouch. Scent is very, very important in the brown hyena world. They very rarely vocalize, and the easiest way to communicate with each other is by smell. While Venus is out looking for food, a task that might take her the whole night and sometimes several days, the cubs remain at the den, which is actually a series of abandoned tunnels dug by an ant bear. The tunnels provide a safe hiding place for the cubs, big enough for them to squeeze through, but too narrow for large predators such as lions. There are lion populations in the Makedi Kedi. The densities aren't high by comparison to non-desert ecosystems, but the lions are highly unpredictable very aggressive in certain situations. When you do come across the lions, you can't be certain that they aren't going to charge you. That's one of the reasons I have this aluminium cage around the quad bike. like the brown hyenas and black-backed jackals, live a difficult life here in the desert, where water is so scarce for most of the year that it's thought that they have to cope by extracting what moisture they can from the food they kill or scavenge. For the smaller inhabitants of the salt pans, life is a little easier. Yellow-tailed mongooses and ground squirrels easily find juicy grubs and insects, which provide all the moisture and nutrition they require. Meerkats are expert desert dwellers. They can survive through the harshest and driest of winters. But even for them, when the rains come, they're welcome. In a good year, the rains start to fall in November and will continue to fall sporadically till April. They bring life to Mahadi Khadi. Within days, the Nata River to the northeast of the salt pans swells with enough water to flow all the way to the pans. This rich supply spreads over the flat expanse, converting the dry salt pans into a shallow inland lake. The water transforms the pans into a living jewel, attracting thousands of migrant water birds. They will remain here all summer. For the next six months, Mahadi Khadi will be a frenzy of activity. While the shallow lake fills with waders, the grass plains teem with thousands of zebras. Absolutely fantastic news. Um, just sighted the first herd of zebra. So the migration is finally back, having been gone for six months. Absolutely brilliant. Um, signifies the official start of the wet season. All the game should be back into the area soon and the brands should be living it up. For the next six months, there will be plenty of food for the brown hyenas. Very little is known about the zebra migration. They seem to have the uncanny instinct to coincide their arrival just after the first rains. By the time they reach the plains, the grass has grown to provide rich summer grazing. The birds that will change the hyena's summer living arrive during the night as many as a quarter of a million flamingos make the annual journey to these pans. For the brown hyenas, the winter famine is over. They will scavenge for eggs and chicks at every opportunity. In the grass plains, the night creatures emerge. The ant bear, or artfark, is a very busy animal of the night. It digs for most of its needs, to look for termites and to build a home. It literally peppers the plains with deep, wide holes.
For some animals, like the hyenas, this animal is their builder. They move into the holes vacated by the ant bear. Bomb sleeps in one of these holes every day, emerging at night to search for food. Brown hyenas are nocturnal, which means I've had to learn to, to also become nocturnal and become active at night. While Glynn follows Bomb or any other hyena at night, he puts a red filter on his spotlight to be less invasive. In this sort of ecosystem, food is very scarce, so they've got to cover big distances looking for food and, of course, any available water. Bomb, like all other brown hyenas, relies more on his sense of smell to find food. He can smell carrion several kilometers away. In his wanderings through the clan's territory, Bomb stops to scent mark every few kilometers. The scent mark is actually uh, a double paste, and it communicates both the individual who made that scent mark, food availability in the territory, and other more subtle things about the hyena and the area. 018 is a pasting, trypodometer 14.5. Glynn records precise location points of all pastings on a GPS, a global positioning system. But while he's busy with this, he often loses Bomb, who manages to disappear like a ghost in the darkness. Once Glynn loses sight of Bomb, it is almost impossible to find him again at night. In fact, Glynn will be very lucky to find any hyena at night. By chance, his lights pick up two hyenas mock fighting. You have to start today follow with uh, Mr. Two, and one of his siblings, whom I haven't identified yet, has actually just come in. And quite interestingly, they're actually beginning to play and neck bite quite vigorously at the moment. They are about 12 months old now, so the neck biting, as regards play, is probably going to become more serious in the next few months. Uh, GPS reading is 0 0.19. Glynn is exceptionally lucky tonight. It's not often that he comes across two hyenas interacting. Uh, Mr. Chu just got up and walked away. So, so far that's uh, one hour of nothing but neck biting to become serious fighting at a later age. The hyenas separate, and Glynn decides to follow Mr. Two. But night follows over grass plains are very difficult. Although the terrain appears to be flat, it is very uneven. And peppered with deep holes made by the ant bears. Holes are a very real problem for me. I can't blame the aardvark. Aardvarks have to eat but I've probably got the world record for falling down three or four hundred holes every single month or two. In the meantime, Mr. Two disappears like a ghost into the night. Glynn is now outside his protective cage. Alone, with his back exposed, he runs the serious danger of being attacked by lions. He has become an expert in pulling his bike out of holes, but he still wastes precious time and by the time he's ready to go, Mr. Two is gone. For tonight, Glynn's research has come to an end. He returns to camp to sleep. By morning, the flooded pans are a flush of pink. Lesser and greater flamingos come here to breed, and Mahadi Khadi caters for both species. Greater flamingos use their feet to disturb the tiny brine shrimps that lie in the muddy bottom. The smaller, lesser flamingos filter the top layer of water for spirulina algae. There is
is another man with a love for the Mahadi Khadi who's doing research here. He's Glynn's good friend, Graham McCullough, an Irishman studying flamingos. To survey where the birds feed and breed, he uses a microlight. From the air, Graham can access the most remote and inaccessible parts of the pans when they're in flood. For more detailed work, Graham goes out in the pan's ankle-deep water. Graham takes regular scoop samples to monitor the brine shrimp populations. The brine shrimp um, lay eggs the previous season, and these eggs lay dormant on the dry pan for, for months on end, sometimes even years. When the pan floods, the eggs hatch out and the brine shrimp emerge and start feeding on algae. This is why the flamingos arrive in great numbers and they come to feed on both the algae and the brine shrimp. Occasionally, while out sampling, Graham finds the remains of dead flamingos. This one, he's sure, was eaten by a brown hyena, a valuable piece of information which he must pass on to Glynn. Glynn, Glynn, Glynn. Roger, Roger. Good morning, Graham. How are you doing over? Excellent. Glynn, Glynn, I just, um, I've just been down sampling on the pans and uh, it looks like there's been a lot of brown hyena activity down here. Maybe you should come uh, check it out, over. OK, fantastic. That's interesting because I haven't picked up Bomb's signal for a couple of days, so maybe he's, he's up your way. Uh, OK, Graham, I'll come by this afternoon then. To cover the 120 kilometre distance between them, Glynn has to drive for four hours. As soon as they meet up, they set out to follow the tracks left by the hyena on a dry portion of the pans. Glynn is excited about filling in another piece of the puzzle in the life of his elusive study subject. The tracks lead into the grass plains, making it more difficult for the two friends to follow. Hyenas have been known to carry their food for up to 30 kilometers to a den, and although during the day they would not be in any danger of being attacked by lions, 30 kilometers on foot in the unforgiving afternoon desert sun would be a trying experience for the two men. Luckily, the researchers find a flamingo carcass only a short distance into the grass plain. Brown hyena. Yeah, it is, hey. I mean, if you look, it's down here and down the hallway. See some, some fresh tracks. Yeah, there's some, adult brown, some yeah, bones there. Definitely. Well. And at sunset, I'm sure the brown will be back up again and finish this off. Glynn wonders if one of these hyenas is bomb. On the pans, the flamingos have begun their courtship ritual, which displays all the discipline of a military parade. Some have already started to build nests from the fine salty mud of the pans, where they will lay no more than two eggs. For the next four weeks, both parents will incubate the eggs. Glynn's attempt at finding Bomb's signal near the flamingo carcass failed. He returns into Bomb's known territory and continues his search. I've been able to work out a system whereby he tends to spend his days resting on the edge of the salt pan. So I do a circuit probably about 15 kilometers from west to east, and in that circuit I do 10 tracking stations. Generally speaking, I will then pick him up on one of those circuits. Once more, Glynn does not pick up Bomb's signal. He's beginning to worry now, and there's still so much water around that he finds it very difficult to travel from one tracking station to another. The summer rains keep the pan's water at a constant level. They replenish the underground water table, keeping the desert alive. Rain or shine, Glynn is out in the Mahadi searching for bomb. 
brown hyenas can travel up to 70 kilometers in one night. And in a month, a young male like Bom could have left his home range and traveled far over this vast expanse, now littered with varying sizes of pools of water. Most of these pools are filled with water as salty as the sea, undrinkable to almost all creatures. But a few of the smaller pools are filled with fresh rainwater. These become vital places for the survival of the summer visitors. Flamingos come here to wash away the salt and mud that collects on their feathers. Mahadi Khadi's temporary residents, such as the zebras, will stay here until the rains stop and the water has evaporated. Having had no luck in locating Bom by searching for his signal, Glynn keeps going back to Bom's birthplace, hoping that he'll return. The members of a brown hyena clan have very close social ties. Although young adults like Bom leave the den to forage for themselves, they often come back to their birthplace to socialize with the younger generation and bring scraps of food. During this time of plenty, Venus doesn't need to venture far from the cubs to find food. But even after a short forage, the cubs are wary of an approaching hyena. It may not be mum. Not all adult hyenas will be friendly to the cubs. So the cubs will always react out of safety first and not really move up to the adult until they know exactly who it is, friend or foe. The cub needs to recognize adult clan members later on in life. And the best way to do this is at a young age to sniff all the visitors' anal patches. Thus, when the cub has grown up, by smelling scent marks, he or she will be able to determine who's been here before him. What information they are able to gain is not clear, but it is thought they can identify the individual, its age and sex, and lastly, what may have been recently eaten. Ever hopeful, Glynn keeps on scanning the area for any signal that Bomb could be nearby. Could something have happened to him? Whatever the reason for Bomb's disappearance, Glynn's research must go on. Tonight there is going to be a lunar eclipse and it will be interesting to see if, if, the, if the moon eclipse does in any way affect the brown hyena's behavior. As the night fades over the pans, Venus leaves for the night's foraging. Although the cubs follow her for a short distance, they know they must remain close to the safety of the den. And tonight, with a total eclipse, it's going to be particularly dark. Glynn doesn't let Venus out of his sight, documenting her every move, while the moon's light slowly fades. Day tribe collected so far indicates that the clan I'm studying actually has a territory of over 700 square kilometers. That really was surprising for me when I started to analyze the data, because that's a vast area, even for brown hyenas. It's 017 is yet another pasting, tripodometer 13.9. Um, that means in the last 20 minutes, um, the brown has pasted nine times, which is quite remarkable. Glynn monitors the eclipse. Venus, on the other hand, appears to ignore it. She's obviously more interested in finding food. The lion's call puts Venus on the alert. They could be anywhere in the darkness enveloping Glynn and Venus. She strains her ears for any telltale sounds. Glynn scans the area around where he can but the lions have the uncanny ability to creep up from behind. When the lions are around, both the browns and, and myself have to pay attention because lions are obviously quite dangerous. 
The brands are in a situation where lions provide food for them, but if they get too close to the lion, then the lion will actually chase and kill them. But tonight, the lions ignore both Glyn and Venus. For them, the sudden darkness provided by the eclipse is a good time to hunt. In the stillness of the night, the zebras sense that danger is near. I didn't see any changes in the brand's behavior with the lunar eclipse, but it did seem that the lions took advantage of the eclipse because they started hunting when the eclipse was at its peak. The night's excitement over and Venus lost into the safety of the summer grasses, Glyn returns to camp. The lions eat till morning. Once they've digested this meal, they will be ready to hunt again. An easy task during the summer months when there's an abundance of food around. By mid-morning, when all his subjects are well hidden in their dens, Glyn is hard at work. He downloads and studies the GPS data from the night's follow. This gives him precise information about the hyena's activities. As Glynn logs the drama of the night before, a daytime drama is unfolding nearby. A zebra foal is trapped in the sticky mud left behind by the drying water at a pool. A well-fed lioness approaches the waterhole. She's a great opportunist, and even if she's not hungry, she will not let an easy hunting opportunity go by. A zebra foal stuck in such a precarious situation would be a very easy catch. Here in the Mahari Khadi, there's a fine line between life and death. A predator's reprieve becomes the prey's pardon. For the lioness, killing for food now is not that important. There's so much game around at this time of year that the lions kill more than they can eat, leaving half-eaten carcasses in their wake. All the more leftovers for the scavengers to feast on. For Glynn, circling vultures is a sure indication that there's food for the brown hyenas. Just found a, a dead zebra on the edge of the salt pan. Certainly plenty of, 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 of meat left on the zebra, so plenty of food there for the browns. It's still too early in the day for the hyenas to come out of hiding, so Glynn prepares for a long wait, and once again, he tries to locate bomb. The first hyena appears before Glynn expected. It's Venus. She quietly assesses the situation and then rushes in to take ownership of the carcass. situation browns and vultures do not compete directly because brown hyenas are nocturnal and vultures are diurnal. There's a very short time in which they overlap basically competing for food. 
The smell of the carcass carries for a long distance over the pans, a pungent smell that would make any hyena's mouth water. 300 kilograms of dead weight is a little difficult to be moved by a 45 kilogram featherweight like Venus. One of her young cubs ventures over the pans. This is the farthest he's ever been from his den. The cub out on the pan is very confused about what's going on here. He's probably never seen an entire zebra carcass in his life. Just bits of legs and bits of ribs, never the entire thing. Venus is nervous. She knows that a large carcass like this will attract other scavengers. For Glynn, this is an incredible research opportunity to study the interaction between hyenas at a feeding site and to observe the interaction between hyenas and other scavengers. Soon a third hyena enters the scene. Glynn has met her before. He named her Hopalong. She's Venus's daughter. Even so, Venus is uneasy. Hopalong is actually Bomb's sister and she somehow got injured. I haven't worked it out yet, but certainly for her, having immediate access to such huge quantities of meat is very, very lucky. Having assessed the situation for long enough, the cub cannot resist temptation any longer. He joins in the feast. And Venus returns as well. Three brown hyenas in situation around a carcass is very unusual. So the whole myth about brown hyenas being solitary dispels. Instantly you see a scene like that. I think Gus Mill said it better. He, he said with brown hyenas they're basically blatantly solitary but secretly social. And trying to see the secretly social bit is very, very difficult. Glynn, ever hopeful, checks where the bomb is in the area. But his aerial picks up no signal. Glynn remains here all night, hoping to see bomb. but by morning there's still no sign of him. The three hyenas have eaten more than enough. Even so, the cub can't seem to stop. The main reason that, that, that brown hyena species as a whole evolved is, is simply as your modern day hoover. There's a lot of carrion out there in, 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 in the bush. There's a lot of things that need to be cleaned up, recycled and put back into the system. If you take away the brown hyena from that, then you're going to have a totally imbalanced system. It just won't work. The whole ecosystem would be affected detrimentally. Showing typical brown hyena behavior, the cub carries food away to stash for harder times. But Glynn is surprised that a cub so young displays such adult behavior. The heat of the day bakes the desolate expanse of the Mahadi Khadi, and the creatures of the night retire to their secret hiding places. Summer is drawing to an end, and the rains have already stopped falling many weeks ago. The surface water is beginning to dry up. The zebras are getting restless. They know it's only a matter of time before they need to leave. On the drying pans, the flamingo chicks are restless too. They congregate in huge nursery groups and wait for their parents to bring back some food. Each mouthful will take them one step closer to their departure. Amazingly, each parent is able to identify its young among this teeming throng. Within the next month, the chicks have to fledge and learn to fly to be able to follow their parents away from these pans, 
that will soon transform back into an inhospitable waterless wilderness. Today, Glyn can have no rest. He needs to restock his supplies, which are running low. For a man living alone in this desolate landscape, this is an essential task. Nevertheless, it is not one that Glyn does with great enthusiasm. For him, this is precious time spent away from his research. It takes him an hour to reach the nearest village, where he meets up with Sam. Good afternoon. How are you doing? The shopkeeper gives him some disturbing news. A hyena was killed on the road. Glynn is concerned it could be bomb. It is very sad to hear that there is a dead brown hyena on the roads. I haven't seen bomb for a long time. He's a young male and he, at that sort of age, you would expect him to disperse. It's not bomb. Just found a brand, but it's also got a, a wine noose. So it looks as if the noose has really dug into the muscle. Um, the areas become infected, hinder the brand's movement, and it's been knocked over by a car. Um, very, very sad. Could bomb have suffered a similar fate? his lifeless body lying discarded on some forgotten road to nowhere. But Glynn's research must go on. He has spent too long searching for bomb. He is now forced to collar another subject. Hi, Glenn. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. To do this, he needs the professional help of the vet Larry Patterson to dart an animal. By dusk, they find a healthy-looking individual, but it's very wary and keeps its distance. By dark, the hyena drops its guard long enough for the vet to get a shot. The darting and collaring of a brown hyena is a crucial time and also a very nerve-wracking time because you only ever really get one chance to, to get a dart in and if you miss out on that chance you probably won't actually get to collar your animal. Also you've got to be very careful not to hurt your animal. Glynn uses his turban to shield the hyena's eyes from the bright light he needs to use to collar and measure the body. This is only the second time that Glynn has been able to be so close to his subject. He makes the most of it. Before fastening the collar, Glynn needs to activate the transmitter. They need to work quickly now. Afraid of overdosing the hyena and killing it in the process, they drugged it with a light dose of tranquilizer. As a result, the hyena drifts in and out of consciousness. It is a very unique opportunity to actually handle your study animal. So as well as putting a collar on, you've got to get as much data as is possible in the time allowed. The animal will usually come around in about 30 minutes to an hour to some degree. So there's a real constraint with time here and you have to take as many scientific data points and measurements as possible. They check the pulse one last time. I'm going to go and stand back. Glyn names his new subject Jankwazi. He will leave him alone for the next couple of days to get over the stress of being manhandled and to get used to his collar. The last remaining water pools have dried up. 
Looks like the zebra migration is heading back to the Pateti, signifying the start of the winter and, of course, a long dry season, lean times for the brands. As for the flamingos, all that's left are their empty nests and the signs in the mud that they were ever here. They vanish as quickly as they arrive except for the unfortunate few. Despite their departure, flamingo research continues through the dry months. Even in death, this flamingo will contribute to Graham's understanding of the Mahadi Khadi system. Winter sets over the endless pans where the desert reclaims its land. Dust devils rise where water once lay. Without water, Glynn finds it easier to move around the area. He drives to a significant point which he marked on his GPS during one of the night's follows. One of the things I found was one of the cubs actually drinking water. I'm going to go back there today and, and see exactly what's going on there, if indeed he was drinking fresh water. That being the case, it really does answer the big question. How are these things surviving out here, considering the lack of other food sources with high water content? The GPS marking is so accurate that Glynn finds his mark immediately. It is truly a, a groundbreaking discovery. If there's one hole here, there could be hundreds in the Makedi Kedi. They can survive without water. We think they've been surviving without water, but in actual fact, they haven't. And what's actually going on here is there's what looks like an aardvark hole accessing the groundwater. Um, there are mosquito larvae in the water, so it's probably quite fresh. Um, I'm just going to taste it and see. Yeah, the water is it's fresh, slightly saline, but certainly if I can drink it, the browns will have no problems drinking it. This is one of the most important discoveries in his research of the Mahadi Khadi hyenas. Ecstatic with the find, Glynn continues his research with renewed enthusiasm. He has noticed that Jankwazi's signal has not moved for 24 hours, so he decides to investigate. I've just found, unfortunately, Tanquazi's collar. There's blood at the base of the collar, which indicates that he's probably died. The collar's only about 10 or 15 meters off the road, about a kilometer from a cattle post. So evidence, unfortunately, points towards him having been shot or trapped. Sadly, I'll probably never know what happened to him. The morning scientific discovery is soured, a bitter end to an incredible animal too few people understand. He feels he needs to do something to redeem Jankwazi's untimely death. He decides to make one last attempt to find Bomb. In desperation, Glynn calls his closest friend. Uh, Roger, Glynn, go ahead, over. Having some problems finding Bomb for a while. I'm not really sure where he's gone to, is there any chance of doing an aerial search of your microlights? You copy over. Uh, Roger Glenn, yeah, I don't see a problem with that. Try and get down there this afternoon and pick you up, over. OK, well that would be fantastic, Graham. Thanks very much. So I'll see you later on today then. They arrange a rendezvous point where Graham can land as close as possible to Bomb's old den site. A quick turnaround 
and the two friends set out in search of Bob. An aerial survey allows Glynn to cover a much larger territory in a shorter time. If Bomb is out there and his collar's battery has not run flat, Glynn will be able to pick up his signal from a height of 2,000 meters above the ground. They start their search over the den site where Venus is sunning herself. Methodically, they cover the ground farther and farther away. After two hours of flying, Glynn is disheartened and ready to give up. But Graham keeps going. Suddenly, Glynn picks up a very weak signal. They fly towards it, over new territory, far from Bomb's birthplace. The signal here is strong, but from this height they cannot see Bomb. Glynn's worst fear is that Bomb could be dead as well. He takes a rough GPS marker and quickly returns to his bike. Only from the ground will he be able to find his exact position. Following the GPS reading, Glynn drives into unfamiliar territory. He's running against time. He needs to make visual contact before dark. Otherwise, it will be very difficult to find Bomb at night. Yes! Gotcha. Just found Bomb, just on sunset. 10 k south of Dead Tree Island, a long, long, long way away from when I last saw him. I put him down at 095, which is 150 kilometers from my last vigil of bomb many months ago. Great, great news. Bomb and Glynn are reunited. Glynn is determined not to lose Bomb, not tonight, after so many months of searching. He follows Bomb's wanderings across his new territory, from dusk till dawn. And then, to a new den with a female and four young cubs. Bomb's just taken me to a new den site. I'm looking at three or possibly four cubs with what looks like um, the mother. Stunning to find, well, my second den site ever, and maybe Bomb is actually the father of these new cubs. Amazing, amazing news. <laughs> Glynn, like Bomb, is a wanderer at heart. Together they are kindred spirits, finally reunited to wander the vast Mahadi Khadi for years to come. Vital players in revealing the secret lives of the brown hyenas of this inhospitable land. It has been a difficult year, and it's taken me a long time to get to grips with what's happening out here with the brown hyenas, with Bomb being lost for a long time and Jan Kozi dying, things were going really slowly. But finally finding Bomb again and also discovering a new den site, it's very exciting. And it really does bode well for the future of my study and more importantly, the long-term survival of the brown hyenas in the Makarikari region. Nakile, nibi 
nakile 